Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our lesson this morning. Hey, uh, I want you to think for a minute about a part of your body, maybe you don't give it a lot of attention, but I know I certainly do sometimes because every now and then I will be eating and I will bite my tongue. And it's in that moment that I pay, I realize I have a tongue, I pay so much more attention to it, and then it hurts for like ever, right? I don't know if you've ever bitten your tongue real hard. Maybe it doesn't even start bleeding. Sometimes mine does, and it's, oh, it's so painful, right? We use our tongues for all sorts of important things though, whether we think about it or not. And if you were here with me in this room today, I probably would bring for you to try a number of different types of foods. I might have a lemon, and I might hold it up, and I, and I might have you taste, a, you know, like give you a lemon wedge, and you might have you dr eat, drink the juice or just lick it or whatever, and you would know that it is sour. Maybe even if you get a little bit of the peel, it might be a little bitter. And then I probably would give you like, I don't know, some chocolate and you would note the sweetness and, 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 then, and then maybe some pretzels and we would note the saltiness. And all of those different tastes are identifiable, large part because of our tongue. Our tongue has the receptors that make taste possible, right? Uh, but what else does it do besides get in the way and help us taste things? Well, I've been using it in the last minute a whole lot, and I've been using it to talk. You see, without our tongues, we can't make the sounds needed to speak and communicate. In fact, let's try a little experiment together. I want you to take your fingers, uh, and, and uh, what I want you to do is I want you to pinch your tongue like this, all right? And then I want you to fly and talk to someone near you. Did you understand the directions? In case you didn't, you got, uh, what I said is, I want you to try and talk to someone who's near you. Okay? Without using our tongues, if we hold our tongue still, it's really hard to speak clearly and get the sound out that we're trying to get out. Right? It might not work at all to talk without our tongues. But here's the thing. Um, I want to show you, do a little demonstration with you. Sometimes we, uh, we, we think we're gonna be able to say certain things and it doesn't always work out for us. It's sort of like this, I have a balloon, right? Let me just blow it up. With all the smoke in the air, I didn't think I'd be able to blow that up. So, all right, look, now what happens if I let this balloon go? I'm not, I don't wanna pop it, but I just, if I let it go, what happens, right? It flies around the room. I have no control over where it goes. I was hoping it would have gone like straight that way and just gone across the room. But what, it just fizzles and, and moves around until it runs out of air. Let's try it one more time. Okay, you got another one. Okay, let's see where this one goes. There it goes, right? I can't control where it goes. It just goes. Sometimes it feels like our tongue's doing the same thing. When does that happen? Well, let's try saying some things together, all right? I'm gonna put some words right here and you see if you can say them three times really fast, all right? The first one's this. Sam shaved seven shy sheep. Sam shaved seven shy sheep. Let's try saying that together. Sam shaved seven shy sheep. Sam shaved seven shy sheep. No, no, I can't get it out right. It's just slurring. Oh, right, we'll, we'll try again. We'll try a different one. Try one. Six silly sheep still asleep. All right. Six silly sheep still asleep. Six silly sheep still asleep. Six silly. My mouth is not working for me for a while. I practiced that for hours. All right, we'll, we'll move away from this sound. Uh, how about this? Billy blows big blue bubbles. Ready? Billy blows big blue bubbles. Billy blows big blue bubbles. Billy blows big blue bubbles. Hmm. How'd you do? I feel pretty proud of myself for getting through that one. All right, uh, but we'll try, we'll try a really short one. Two words. I think you can do this. Greek grapes. Let's try this one seven times, okay? Ready? Greek grapes, Greek grapes, Greek grapes, Greek grapes, Greek grapes, Greek grapes, Greek grapes. I think I said grape a whole lot, which isn't a word. But anyways, sometimes our tongues don't really work the way we would want them to. We can't quite get the right words out. Sometimes 
That's just our tongue getting all twisted up. Sometimes we use that as an excuse for saying bad things. Oh, I didn't mean that. Oh, that was an And that's what we kind of want to explore today. Because in James chapter 3, he talks about our tongue. Now, it's a part of our body, yes. It's the part of our body that is responsible for the words sounding a certain way. And so as he uses it, it's a word picture. When you hear tongue, think the words we say. Because that's what he's trying to communicate with these verses. Let me read them for you. I have my Bible. Here. Let's read. I want to read for you a few. Oh, I dropped my Bible. Whew. Good thing I had a bookmark. All right. I want to read for you a few verses from James chapter 3. And it says this. The tongue is a small part of the body, but, uh, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. If you live in the Okanagan, you know, or in BC, really, most of the world, Western Canada especially, we had a lot of fires around, right? And it doesn't take much to start a huge blaze. We'll, we'll come back to that idea in a moment, though. Okay? The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of, you, you might be thinking at that point, like, hey, why not just cut the thing out and be rid of it? Slow down. That's not the point of this. That's not James' point, is not Let's just get rid of our tongues or let's never talk again. That's not what he or I are trying to say here, but stick with us. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Okay, so that's what he says. He's talking about the words we use and how we make them and what, where do they come from. And the point isn't never talk. The point is this, because, because a lot of good can also come from our words, right? They can bring, like he talks in there, two different springs of water. Some is fresh water. That's like, it brings life. Ref not just refreshment, but without fresh water, there would be no life. So life can come from our words, from our tongue, but so can salt water. And if all we had was salt water, we wouldn't survive, okay? So our tongue, our words can lead to life or can lead to death. He uses an image in there and just a, a couple verses before we started reading about a ship's rudder. And he says the tongue is like the rudder of a ship. So the tongue is a small part of our body, just like the rudder of a ship is a fairly small part of a ship. It's not that big in the grand scheme of things. A small part that has major impact because the rudder is the part that helps the captain steer the boat. The captain turns usually a wheel, which turns a rudder. Sometimes it's a big arm on the side. I guess I should use this arm and say better, right? They hold a pole that comes off the side and they just kind of move it this way. Anyway, the, the rudder is moved by the captain and the boat changes course of direction. Small part, big impact. Just like our tongue, we can, we can speak words of life, we can bless people, and we can steer them towards life. We can speak words of death, those salty words, the words that are essentially curses, and we can lead people towards death with our words. We can build people up, or we can tear them down. We can encourage, or we can defeat. We can bring to health and wholeness, or we can lead to their destruction. And so we have to choose carefully. How are we gonna steer people with our words? More than that, how are we gonna steer ourselves with our words? Because the tongue is just a rudder. The tongue is like a spark that can start a fire, he says in there too. Have you, I've heard actually our words sometimes likened to this analogy. It's like a tube of toothpaste. Um, I don't know how it happens, but in our household, we regularly have globs of toothpaste on our counter. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but it happens. It's on 
almost never the type of toothpaste that I use, but that's another story, okay? It ha toothpaste ends up on the counter. Have you ever tried putting toothpaste back in a tube? It's nearly impossible, right? It is. It is. You squeeze it out, it doesn't go back. It's a one-way thing. And our words are kind of like that, right? We speak and we don't really get to control what happens next. It's like those balloons. We let them go and they go their own way. We speak and then if it hurts people, it's there. You can't take it back. People might misunderstand us and we can try and correct it, but it doesn't always work. We should be careful how we speak because if our tongue is out of control, a whole lot of hurt can happen. So how do we tame our tongue? He talked in there, James talked in there, he referenced the fact that so many animals are being tamed. He says, yeah, it's kind of impossible to tame the tongue, but is it? Or does it just require some work? How do we tame it? Because on its own, it's actually nothing. I have to move it. I have to move my tongue. You have to move your tongue. It doesn't have a mind of its own, contrary to what some might say. It's just a collection of muscles. It's nothing without something moving it. So the question is, what moves your tongue? What causes it to speak and to make the sounds? You see, the real point is this, uh, and what James is kind of alluding to is that we have to pay attention to what's on the inside. Because what's on the inside, what's in our mind, what's in our heart, how our emotional health, our mental health, all of that has an impact on what we say. So we need to pay attention to the inside. Jesus addressed it this way. He uh, called out some religious leaders in his day, and he called them whitewashed tombs that are pretty on the outside, but full of decay on the inside. You see, they had this practice in Jesus' day. They would often bury people in a cave. And, uh, well, as you probably can guess, when you put people in a cave, they rot. There's then disease present as the body decomposes. It stinks, it's nasty, it's really gross. But what people would do is they'd come along and they'd paint the outside of the tomb so it would look nice. And Jesus said, you know what, sometimes people are the same way. We, we spend a lot of time focusing on our outward appearance and we make sure we look really good so that when others see us, they think, oh, that's a nice person. But on the inside, we're just full of rot, decay, death. And what ultimately is more helpful to others? That we're just look nice on the outside but are rotten on the inside? No, the point is if we're, we, if we need to be healthy on the inside and then we can offer health and life to others. Another way of looking at this, this morning, just this morning, I took out the compost. I thought, oh, the compost pail's getting kind of full. I should go dump it. So I take my nice little pail. It's this lovely brown pail with a nice white handle. It's a really lovely pail. And I take it outside and I, I get out to my compost bin and I lift the lid of the compost bin and I lift the lid of my compost bucket and I dump out the first bit and, and then I look. And all the fruit that I had put in there, really vegetables that were starting to rot, they kept rotting and they kept decomposing in my lovely little pail. And now it was fuzzy and moldy and absolutely putrid. This goo that was collected in there was vile. So I dump it out. Because that's what we do with rotten stuff on the inside. We have to get rid of rotten stuff. Or what? It's just gonna wreck more and more and more. I have an apricot tree in my yard. If, if you live uh, around the Okanagan, it's such, this is my favorite time of year. Why? Because we have so much good fruit that's ripening right now. And so in my backyard, I, I grow some fruit. And uh, this, is an, this is an apricot from my backyard. I picked this just yesterday. And uh, I picked another apricot with it. And I have this, I, I don't know, I, I don't know if there's a right way or a wrong way to eat an apricot. I, I have a particular way I like. And uh, what I do is I, I split them open. And uh, I'm not, this is not a how to eat an apricot thing. You might think this is weird, but this is just what I've, I don't know, something I, I started to do. I just kind of rip it open like that. And I, so, and then I, I 
kind of like to just pop these in as a whole, which probably is gross and you might think is kind of rude, but that's what I did. And, and I had this apricot and oh my goodness, it was just such a beautiful orangey yellow and, and the fruit just looked absolutely amazing. And I thought this is gonna be, I love apricots. When they're ripened on the tree and they're just so soft and mm, they're just amazing. And so I take this apricot, it looked absolutely beautiful. It just looked like, I thought this is gonna be a treat. I'm so excited because they're just finally ready. And I ripped it in half and I looked and there was a big spot of black mold. The, somehow this apricot that was perfect on the outside, not soft, but not hard, and the right kind of yellow, and it just looked flawless. On the inside, it was vile. It was absolutely disgusting. If I had just taken that and looked at the outside and gone, oh, oh apricot, you are so pretty. I am gonna get you in my mouth and you are gonna taste good. And if I just bitten it in half, I'd have been, I'd have been vomiting all over the place. It would have been so nasty. Because the outside, it doesn't matter. The inside does. The inside is what matters, and what's inside is what impacts our tongue and what actually eventually comes out. So, as Jesus was saying with those religious leaders, we've got to pay attention to the inside. What, what James is saying and talking about our tongues isn't just about what we say. We've got to pay attention to where our heart is at, what kind of stuff we're feeding our mind, because that impacts what comes out. And so if we wanna be people who bring words of life, who help others, who just actually are nice, pleasant people to be around, we have to pay attention to our spiritual health. We have to be right on the inside. We have to make sure that we are full of good fruit, right? Like love and joy and peace and patience. You know what, that's the type of person I wanna be. Those are the people I like hanging out with. Those are the people that when I'm having a hard day, I know I can go to a person of peace and I can say, hey, here's, here's where I'm at, and they often have a good word that brings me towards life. Those are the people we need. Those are the people actually Jesus calls us to be, right? And how do we get there? We have God's spirit in us. God in us, alive in us, helps us become people who are full of healthy fruit. Not the fruit like I almost ate yesterday, not the fruit like what was in my compost pail, but good fruit. Fruit like that apricot I just split in half and you better believe I'm eating that the second this camera goes off, right? Good fruit, life-giving fruit. We need God's spirit alive and active in us. Then we get there. Then because of that, without that, even if we had, we're at a good place at one day, at one point in time, but we've not done anything to maintain that, then that eventually turns rotten too. James offers a few practical helps, kind of some ways to help uh, be sensitive to God's work within us. And the first thing he goes on to talk about in the next chapter in chapter four is he talks about how uh, as followers of Jesus, we need to be humble people. So we avoid pride. We avoid arrogance. In other words, we recognize that we are uh, healthy because of God's work within us. We don't go around saying, yes, I'm so good. Oh, I'm so great. I'm so wonderful. But we go and say, you know what? Yeah, I'm doing okay because God is doing a good work in me. We recognize him active in our lives. Humility is also about putting others, uh, giving others an important place in their life. Not saying that we ourselves are the most ultimate greatest one, but we recognize that we are, um, we're not greater than God. We give God his greatest place, but we also treat others well. The way they would want to be treated, or even uh, Paul talks about treating others better than ourselves. So we defer to others, or we give others, uh, uh, we, we look to their health too. So we, that, that's partly what it means to be humble. Uh, in verse eight of chapter four, James talks about how we, he says this, he says, come near to God and he will be near to you. So another way that we work on having, you know, being healthy on the inside is we enjoy our relationship with God. So the first one is that we, we give him the, uh, the role, his proper place in doing the work in us. And we recognize that he's doing something good, but then we just enjoy that relationship. 
We, we come near to him. We, we spend time with him. We, 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 have, we just have a relationship with God. The third thing we can do is he says in actually in verse 9, he encourages us to wash our hands. Interesting phrase. Probably been doing a lot of hand washing, right? In the last, uh, well, hopefully always, but I know especially since March 2020, we've been talking a lot, or even February uh, 2020, we're talking a lot about hand washing, right? Wash your hands. In other words, uh, purify yourself. Not just the outside. It's a bit of a metaphor for cleaning our hearts. Purifying our hearts. So how, in other words, how do we do that? How do we become pure? And we seek forgiveness, right? When we do something wrong and hurt someone else, we seek forgiveness. When we do something and we hurt God, we seek forgiveness. Now, you might be thinking, hey, I, I've been forgiven. Absolutely true. Right? When we come to God and we say, you know, I'm sorry, and we ask for forgiveness, God will always forgive you. And because, you know, most of us have a particular, have a bent towards selfishness, toward pride, toward arrogance, towards only looking out for our own interests and not others, then, well, we might need to seek forgiveness again and again and again. Because chances are, uh, unless you're perfect, which newsflash, none of us are, uh, you're likely going to need to seek forgiveness again at some point in your life. And so, to have the heart to be right and full of life on the inside, we need to be people who are quick to seek forgiveness, to restore relationship, to let God remove our sin and trust that he actually did it. We don't seek forgiveness because we think we'll be uh, lost without it. We seek it because it's just going to help us have a better relationship because it actually is the healthiest thing to do. We seek forgiveness as much for the other, uh, as much for the other person as really for ourselves. It helps us when we seek forgiveness. And so, uh, through humility, uh, recognizing God's important role in our lives, through relationship, just enjoying time with him, and through seeking forgiveness and restoration, we can be really healthy on the inside. Then God's spirit in us can do the real gardening, the real work of producing good fruit so that we can speak words that lead others to places of health and life. And also we can lead ourselves there through our words too. So that's our lesson and our reminder for us this week from the book of James. Let me pray for us as we go. God, we thank you that your spirit in us is gonna do a good work if we let him. And so I pray that we would be people who seek forgiveness and walk humbly and spend time with you so that your spirit alive in us will help us be people who are healthy and may we share health with others by being a spring of fresh water and saying words of blessing and encouragement and affirmation to those in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, everyone. Have a great week.